Good afternoon. My name is Arit Gadish. I'm the chairman of Bain & Company, and I'd like to welcome you to this session uh, on creating a shared future through education and empowerment. Before I introduce our panel, allow me to make a distinction between education and empowerment. Education is a precondition for empowerment, but it's not sufficient. Education informs us, shows us how to reach for the stars, if you will. Empowerment gives us permission to do so. Just consider this for a moment. There's a lot of discussion about elite education at all levels everywhere in the world. But what really sets these institutions apart? Their facilities may be a little better, their uh, faculty perhaps more distinguished, and maybe they're teaching a little more effective. But what is far more important is the affect that they have on those who pass through them. Their graduates have come to believe that the stars are actually really in their grasp. They have got education and they feel empowered. Many, of course, will not actually be able to grasp the stars, but it will not be because they did not get the education that would have allowed them to do or because they didn't feel empowered to try. Looking ahead, an increasingly important marker of good education will be that it inspires people to continue to learn new things. We know today that in the decades ahead, our economies and the employment opportunities they provide will change faster than they ever have. And our population will have to learn how to do jobs that do not exist today. That means our education systems will have to empower them to adapt to whatever new careers emerge. And it also means that people of all ages will have to want to and to believe that they can meet this challenge through continuous learning. When we talk about empowering more, <coughs> more young people, we generally talk about groups who have suffered discrimination for reasons of gender, skin color, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, and I would add those held back because of economic deprivation. It's easy to see this as an ethical imperative, as indeed it is. But it's more than that. It's a cold, hard economic challenge. Worldwide, we waste an incalculable amount of human potential. Lack of access to education, especially for girls in much of the developing world. Inadequate education when access is less of a problem. Creativity and innovation limited by excluding diverse backgrounds and experiences. People who could learn new skills unable or unwilling to do so. And most of all, our failure to empower young men and women to reach for the highest levels and to actually achieve great feats. We cannot afford to live in such a world and we should not wish to. To discuss all of this, we have a distinguished panel here, a group of individuals who share this passion. I'll introduce them very briefly. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fabiola Giamotti is one of the world's most distinguished particle physicists. She is the first woman director general of CERN. She's also a co-chair of this year's meeting. Malala Yousafzai, I hope I pronounced it right, is famous for having the courage to demand an education. That courage was recognized by the Nobel Committee in 2014 when Malala became the youngest ever Nobel laureate. She's co-founder of the Malala Fund, which champions every girl's right to 12 years of free, safe, quality education. Justin Trudeau is Prime Minister of Canada. A former teacher himself, he has actually responsibility for the education system of one of the world's leading nations. As a G7 host this year, he has put education and especially empowerment squarely on the agenda. Well, I'd like to start with you, if I can. Without education, empowerment is a distant dream. So let's start with access. What are the main roadblocks that obstruct access to education before we even get to talking about empowerment? Uh, well, thank you so much, and it's an incredible opportunity to be here among incredible people. Uh, as you already mentioned, education is a way towards women's empowerment. And what are the barriers that girls are facing right now? Well, it varies between country to country, from region to region, and in some parts, you see that women <clears throat> and, and girls cannot have access to education because of uh, 
transport because there is not a school nearby their community or because their parents do not allow them <coughs> to go to school. In some parts it's early child marriages or child labor or child trafficking. In some parts it's poverty. It's, um, it's, it's because the, the government has not invested enough money into the education of girls. So issues vary, and I think that's what we have to remember uh, in our approach towards solving the issue, that we have to ensure that there are quality teachers available, that there is uh, enough schools available in each region for girls, that uh, the ratio of schools between girls and boys is even. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, th there is transport facilities for girls. So we, we, we have to address all these issues, and it, and it varies across uh, regions. Thank you. We'll get back to more empowerment in a minute. Um, Prime Minister, what are the steps that you advocate for ensuring that all young Canadians, independent of what may hold them back, are not only educated but empowered to reach their full potential as citizens of Canada? Well, I think one of the things that, that we know is that for a society to prosper, everyone has to be able to contribute uh, their own potential, fulfill their dreams, and making sure that everyone has a real and fair chance to succeed needs to be a fundamental priority for any community, any society. Uh, obviously that means, and I, I certainly brought it up uh, in my speech a couple of days ago, ensuring that uh, hiring, retaining, uh, promoting more women within the workplace uh, is essential. But as Malala said, the barriers are multiple to women's success. It's not just a desire to do the right thing and the smart thing uh, that'll make it happen. We need to look at all the building blocks, all the, all the challenges every step of the way. Uh, and that's where uh, funding education, uh, investing in uh, initiatives like getting more girls into STEM, uh, the science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, encouraging coding, um, looking at the tools we're giving to vulnerable populations, marginal populations, populations have been left out of success. Women, of course, has been a, a traditionally underrepresented or long underrepresented population in, in our success in our workforce. Uh, but there are so many intersectionalities we also have to talk about. Uh, women of color, women of, of, uh, from the LGBTQ community. Um, indigenous women and, and how we're empowering, particularly in Canada, uh, working on bringing indigenous uh, people, women and girls, into pathways of success uh, so that they know that they have an essential role to shape our society. And it's not just about making sure that uh, more women have the opportunity to succeed because everyone should have an opportunity to succeed, although that's of course a good baseline. It's that when you empower women, when you educate women, the conversations change. The types of success that is built changes. Society itself improves, both with uh, a greater diversity and representativity in uh, positions of power in organizations, but also in the kinds of decisions that are made. So we recognize that bringing in a broad range of diverse voices, first and foremost, making sure uh, that women have full opportunities to contribute is absolutely essential. Thank you. Talking about, for a moment, opportunities for women, um, hard sciences. Fabiola, you really are a shining star for people who uh, who succeeded in something that has a minority of women still. What gave you the permission, quote unquote, to do so, and what would you suggest in terms of generations to come? So I think for me, um, the the main issue and the main uh, um, say uh, push to uh, to science came from uh, from role models. Okay, so inspiration by role models, and for me, uh, that was a biography of Marie Curie. So I read about a biography of Marie Curie when I was 17, and I was really impressed and, and you know, excited by her way of doing science. Science being an, an integral part of her life because she had her laboratory at home, so she could go in the kitchen and prepare the soup for dinner and then run in the laboratory to change the uh, radioactive samples. You know, <laughs> this science being part of your life, um, for me, was something really that an integral part like you have family and, 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 and friends, etc. That was great. So, and 
even today's role models are so important uh, for, uh, for the younger generation, for, for, for girls, for boys, for everyone else. The other important thing is that people, the young people, have to understand what will be their impact on society, on the world, if they study STEM or uh, humanities or something else. So are they going to have an impact because they can contribute to the, uh, to the technology? Or For me, I was a very curious child. And so for me, was being able to contribute to answer the big question on how the universe works. And for me, that was very sexy. So that, 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 that's what really <laughs> brings me. To. But I would like to, to say that I'm a strong supporter of really a multidisciplinary and a varied education to build and to form, say, well-rounded citizens, regardless of what your own job at the end will be. I give you my personal example. I have been studying humanities at high school, Latin, ancient Greek, art, history of art, everything except physics. And I've been studying music in parallel at the conservatories. And then, later on, I decided to move to physics at university level. And I could do so because the Italian education system uh, gives access to most of the faculties, regardless of the kind of uh, high school education. And this is very important because, you know, uh, people are too young at the age of 13 or so when they start high school to decide about their future. So we should not close career paths too early because a few more years contribute a lot to the maturity of a choice, your choice. And I can tell you that uh, my humanity and my music studies have contributed to what I am today as a scientist, as much as my physics studies. That is, it's a wonderful story, actually. It's a, I hope we all learn from that. Um, we're focused a little bit in what you talked about, the developed world, and let me just get back to the developing world, where there is an awful lot of lack of access, we talked about before, but also quite a number of barriers to empowerment, because as all just about you mentioned, both of you mentioned, it is not enough just to educate. And there are different barriers in different places for empowerment, but where most of your experience is, how do you, how do you move to actually change the social dialogue, among other things, around empowerment of women, for example, and not just education? Yeah, for Marlana. Um. <clears throat> Well, I think uh, we do want to see change. And for that, education is the only way that I see for women empowerment. And it's not the job of one person. Everyone has to play a role in this, whether it's at government level or business level or NGO level or local activist level. And that is something that I have recognized right from the beginning. And uh, what I personally am doing through Malala Fund is I am empowering and reaching out to local advocates in Pakistan, in Nigeria, uh, in Latin America, in, in India, and we are empowering them so that they can bring change in their local communities, whether it's teachers training, whether it's uh, bringing STEM skills, whether it's giving e-learning. I'm also focusing on empowering girls because they are, they are the future and giving them a voice so that they can speak out for their rights. They can try to speak out about the issues that they're facing. So I'm doing that, but then also governments and, and uh, presidents and prime ministers, they have a big role uh, in, uh, in making sure that women uh, can have access to quality education, they can have access to opportunities, and I think some countries are leading in that and they're stepping forward, uh, especially Canada. Like, I'm really looking forward to G7 and, uh, and, and the steps that you would be taking. We would be excited to hear about those, but I think it's everyone has to play their role. And I'm also uh, really, uh, I think that business sector should uh, definitely invest in the education and empowerment of women. And this is, uh, this is an investment on which the return is very high. The return is high, the profits are high, and the opportunity cost is, is low. They, they, when you invest in a girl, you are contributing to that girl individually. She is she's going to have a future, but you're also impact, impacting her, the, the, the country, the nation, you, it is helping in economic growth, it helps reduce poverty, it helps us tackling climate change, uh, so it helps us to reduce child labor, child trafficking, early child marriages, so the benefits and the advantages are countless. It is just reminding ourselves that we have to take a step, and that step is investment in education, donor countries, developing countries, business sector, governments, everyone has to come together and play their role. 
on the uh, Global Partnership for Education, uh, which is such an important initiative that uh, Malala, you're so in involved in. Uh, it's something that's really exciting, and actually there's a bit of synchronicity to it for me, because 16 years ago, uh, at a uh, then G8 meeting that Canada was chairing in Kananaskis in Canada, uh, the idea that would become the Global Partnership for Education was actually launched. Uh, and what uh, you are doing and what the Global Partnership is doing around the world right now is so meaningful. A few weeks from now in Senegal, there's going to be uh, an announcement of the replenishment of the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, and Canada is pleased to uh, uh, announce that we're going to be uh, pledging $180 million, and we're actually doubling our yearly contribution to the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, So that's, that is important, so I'm going to repeat that in French for the folks back home. <laughs> I'm really happy to be able to announce that Canada is going to double its annual contribution for this World Partnership for Education, and this announcement will be made in two weeks' time in Senegal. $180 million in the years to come will be contributed to make sure that young in developing countries get education, and especially young... Empowering women and girls uh, through education, empowering the developing world through education is an essential pathway towards success. And that's actually also part of why Canada uh, set forward uh, a feminist international development policy. We know that as we look to have the maximal impact on improving outcomes for people in the developing world, uh, investing in women and girls not only has been done less than is fair or is necessary over the past, uh, past years, but is the most effective way of making a real and lasting difference. And that's uh, why we are so excited about, uh, about the, uh, the partnership on the Global Fund for Education, Global Partnership for Education. Uh, and also, uh, the full circle part is this year we're hosting the G7. Uh, and in many G7s, there's been discussions of gender, and it's important to talk about empowering women. And in many different organizations, we talk about it and say, OK, what can we do around the empowerment of women? Well, this year, we're taking a different approach on the G7. And instead of making it as a specific and important topic, we're making it touch everything we do. We've pulled together, as I announced a couple of days ago, a council a G7 Women's Council that will be led by Melinda Gates and our ambassador to France, Isabelle Hudon, with uh, many extraordinary women being part of it. And their job is to make sure that everything the G7 does, all the meetings, all the commitments, all the initiatives that we partner in uh, this year and hopefully into the future, have a gender lens. That everything is looked at in terms of how it uh, respects, empowers, enables women to be more successful, and I think that's uh, something that we have to look at doing uh, in more and more organizations, in more and more of things we do as business as usual. Thank you. You want to add something? Well, I, I clearly I, 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 I applaud this uh, uh, wonderful initiative. I would like to, to mention that uh, I, I work in a, an international organization, a big research center, so CERN, a European Laboratory for Particle Physics, where we do fundamental research. So we, we run uh, uh, most powerful accelerators to understand the fundamental constituent of, of the universe. Now, CERN brings together 17,000 scientists from all over the world representing more than 100 different nationalities. Some of these scientists come from countries in conflict, and yet they work together, animated by the same passion for knowledge and in, in pursuit of common goals. Now, if you look at the age profile of these 17,000 scientists, the peak is at 27 years. And about 40% of our scientists are below 35. So it's a very, very young population. And, uh, of course, we educate them to we form them and train them for science, for particle physics, for big data, for computing, for technology, etc. But CERN is a wonderful place also to uh, grow these people, to, to, uh, to, to help these people understand the importance of peace collaboration, to grow in an environment which is respectful, tolerant, and which values 
the importance of diversity and inclusiveness. Actually, most of our young people do not stay in research because the number of jobs in research is limited, typically 10% of them. The other goes out and 60% go to the private sector. So we also form them for the private sector. And if you want, if you, if you, if you look at, at their career, a recent, recent survey shows that 80% uh, of them are very, very happy with their current job, which is very good. And about 70% of them thinks that what they learn at CERN, the skills they learn at CERN, have been fundamental for their current, for finding the job or for their current job. And you know what these skills are? Analytical thinking, critical thinking, international collaboration, communication, partnership, flexibility. So that's our, you know, the, uh, the, the, that, that the skills. Is, that, that is a great education. Yes. But for a very limited number of people, unfortunately. Yes. And uh, it, it's, it sounds like I'd like to go and just get some courses there right now. <clears throat> but and if, if we can get from there sort of how you would imagine that our entire education will have, will support these kind of skills as opposed to specific pieces of knowledge because everybody will have to learn more and use their ability to reskill themselves or the ability to be open to be reskilled going in the future. So perhaps starting with you. If you allow me, I don't want to, 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 to talk too much, but for me, a good education, regardless of the type, STEM, humanities, etc., is an education that gives the young people the tools to address the work market, to address uh, the, the challenges of, of life. And these tools are general tools, um, critical thinking, uh, speaking about science a bit, understanding the importance of the scientific method and of evidence-based assessment, also to distinguish between fake news, real news, you know that nowadays we are bombarded by all kinds of news. These are the tools that you need to have. And if you allow me a, a, a little bit of a pun, uh, people should get the skills to be able to change their skills with time because the market job is changing, society is changing, technology is changing fast. And it's not granted that what you learn today will be useful tomorrow. So you be, must be ar armed, you must be prepared to change and adapt your, your skills in a flexible way. So that's what we have to do. I think everybody here now wants to understand how we can distinguish between fake news and real news. And Fabiola, I'm sure we'll have a seminar later on on that. Um, but those kind of tools, and, and how do you take that into responsibility of government on a broad sense for all citizens? Oh, well, first of all, understanding, as you've said, as Fabiola said, as everyone knows, the changing nature of work, the challenges in the workplace that are going to require uh, a greater understanding of technology and of science. Uh, and as Fabiola well said, you know, just because you study science doesn't mean that you are going to be a scientist or a researcher. Uh, there, it is so essential that when we think of the place, technology, of AI, of robotics, of, of automation, of everything that's going to be coming into every single workforce, I don't care if you're going to be uh, you're writing symphonies or directing movies uh, or uh, working as an accountant or uh, working as a teacher, uh, you are going to need to be powerful users of technology. And that's where particularly uh, encouraging uh, people who haven't uh, or are underrepresented in uh, STEM education, uh, women, is hugely important. I mean, in Canada, uh, we have uh, a number of people who are extremely strong advocates for, uh, for science. Our Governor General uh, is uh, one of uh, Canada's uh, top, uh, top uh, astronauts uh, and uh, does an incredible job inspiring about how important science is. Uh, our uh, Minister of Science is a Nobel winning uh, scientist who's constantly uh, investing in looking for ways to encourage fundamental science and encourage better science education. Uh, and our new position of uh, Canadian uh, the governmental uh, science advisor uh, is uh, a world-class re researcher who is making sure that evidence and science is at the base of everything we do. Uh, those are sort of the top three uh, scientists in our country or science uh, leaders in our country. 
they're all women. Uh, Julie Payette, Kirsty Duncan, uh, and, and uh, Mona Nemer. So we know uh, that showcasing the extraordinary strength of uh, women in science and of the path of the role modeling, as Fabiola says, is essential uh, to, to, to make sure that our society and our workplaces and our citizens are able to meet the challenges of a transforming world as lifelong learners. And that's something that me as a former school teacher understands is so important, but we all get that. Can I just follow up on that? So how is the actual curriculum changing? What are the most interesting changes that uh, would be useful to understand. Well, I mean, one of the challenges we have in Canada is that, uh, and it's one of the benefits of having a federation, uh, different provinces have control entirely over their K-12 education system, so uh, they can be more responsive to what their needs and concerns are. Uh, but because of that, the federal government, even though I was a school teacher, uh, you know, we're limited in our ways of weighing in on the education system. So we have to look for uh, ways of sometimes sneaking around it. And one of the things we did is, I know, uh, and Fabiola knows I'm a total science geek, uh, yeah, and I you know, learned how to code C++ back in university, and, and, and <laughs> I understand how important, even to this day, when I don't do a lot of coding as prime minister, understanding how algorithms algorithms work, understanding the scientific method is so important. We created uh, a, a non-profit initiative to provide schools with opportunities to teach coding. So it's sort of a way that we're not weighing in on provincial jurisdictions on education, but we are making sure that schools, school districts, teachers have the capacity to, and the tools and the training to teach coding uh, from kindergarten on forward because that's going to be essential. And how we work together on recognizing that as an essential path is, uh, is going to be critical to Canada's success, to our world's success, uh, as we get through this transition into the fourth industrial revolution. Well, would you like to add to that? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau for uh, your commitment to Global Partnership for Education. And on behalf of 130 million girls, thank you and merci. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, thank you so much for your work as well. And I think, yes, investing in science in, is, is just so crucial and it applies to all subjects, not just science, uh, yeah. evidence, empirical evidence, data. These are such important things and we shouldn't take them for granted and uh, we should invest in these. Um, but I hope that as Canada is, uh, is leading in this, I hope that other countries can also uh, follow this example and they can also make commitment towards girls' education in Dakar next week. And uh, I hope that uh, one day we will see all girls going to school and getting quality education. So. So I am I'm really positive and, and really hopeful. And uh, the education is, is not just, uh, if, if you look at the figures of how empowering women can contribute to the global economy, like imagine if women are brought into workforce, like it could uh, increase the GDP of US by 5%, Japan by 9%, India by 27%. It can, it can, it can lead to the global growth as well in, in trillions of dollars. So the outcomes and the benefits are countless. And I think for that, again, investing in women, investing in girls' education is, is just so crucial. Let me just, to continue with that, because one of the things, you talked about India and some of the uh, developing world where the potential is, is even more enormous than perhaps some of uh, the developed world. But a lot of those things that are blocking them are really social and culture. And how much in your work do you see the ability or the beginning of the changing? Because otherwise, a lot of people will be left behind if we don't bring up our cultures and our values along with that. So I always have that in mind. And that is why we are working with local partners, local activists, because we, we, under, we know the culture. We know the, the, that if, if there is an NGO based in a Western country coming and working in Lebanon or, uh, 
or Afghanistan, it can be a challenge. That is why my approach is that we work with local activists, we support them because they know the problems and they know the solutions. They know how to best solve those problems. So in Afghanistan, there is a challenge that there are not enough women teachers for girls. That is why parents don't send their girls to school because they are afraid that they don't want male teachers to be teaching their girls. So that's why we're supporting a teacher's training, women teacher's training. Uh, in, in Lebanon, we are supporting uh, tech education and, and e-learning. And recently, uh, I visited that project. I went to Lebanon, I think it was on Saturday. So I've been quite busy and traveling. I uh, hope the university is kind to me and uh, excuses me, but... Um, I can write you a note if you Yeah, we have made an agreement. That's why I'm here. Uh, but I hope that, like, I'm giving up my, my days of school because I want to highlight that the education of women and, and girls is just so important. I was in Lebanon, and we were in this gathering of around 12 girls, and they were all Syrian refugee girls. And I asked girls the question that, what do they want to be in future? And one girl said she wants to be an architect. And I asked why. And that girl said that she wants to be an architect because on the day that she left Syria, she saw her country destroyed and devastated. And that day she decided that she would become an architect so one day she can rebuild her country. So this is the passion that I see among these girls that gives me courage to continue on fighting for girls' education. And when you meet these girls, whether they are in, in Mexico, whether they are in Nigeria, in Lebanon, in Afghanistan, these girls are so passionate about learning, about going to school, about getting their education, because they know that that is how they can get their future, because they know that that is how they're going to get empowered. So the empowerment of girls is only possible through quality education, and we have to keep on pushing for this. And I hope as Canada is taking steps that other countries will follow, uh, and, 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 they will, and they will take an action. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so to add on that, clearly, um, equal access to education is one of the challenges today. It has been already mentioned several times. So what can we uh, research, scientific research institution do for that? And I, I'm a very strong supporter, and CERN is, and many other organizations are, for what we call open science. So making science available to everybody for free. So it means publishing our results and our articles on open access journals, where nobody has to pay for. Uh, developing open, uh, open source software, open source hardware that we can share. So for instance, we have programs at CERN to um, you know, um, develop digital libraries in Africa by going there and teaching to the people there on how to build these libraries. Because the important thing to empower people is not just to go and to fix the problem, but to help them get the tools and education to be able then to continue by themselves. Um, so, and, and the other important point that has been mentioned uh, by both uh, the Prime Minister and, and Malala is educating teachers. Teachers, of course, get a lot of training at, at school and in their, in their uh, curriculum uh, path, but it's very, very good to get them, uh, you know, um, uh, inspired by, uh, in case of science, by a real science. So at CERN we have a, a program, a teacher's program, where every year we, we welcome 1,000 teachers, high school teachers from all over the world. They come to CERN, they spend a couple of weeks with us, and they get a complement of, you know, uh, ed education about and training on hands-on physics, modern experimental physics. A teacher is a multiplier, because behind the teacher there are hundreds of students. So it's very important also to, you know, stressing what already was already said to uh, focus also on the teachers and, and in in, uh, in government in the choices we make I mean I think a number of you know uh, that as a proud feminist I was glad to put forward a gender balanced cabinet and we have 50 percent men 50 percent women uh, in uh, our government cabinet and someone mentioned to me, oh, that's great that for the first time uh, a full half of the cabinet will be focused on women's issues. And I had to correct them right away and said, no, no, that means 100% of the cabinet will be better focused and more, uh, more richly informed as we uh, engage on women's issues. And I have uh, a number of uh, members here, a member of uh, the Minister for Innovation, uh, Minister of Finance, and the Minister for the Status of Women uh, here. It's great to see you. Um, the finance minister, uh, in a conversation uh, that Bill had with Miriam, our minister of status of women, really highlighted for me uh, what a gender approach or a feminist government is supposed to be thinking about. And it's not 
of course it's important, bringing forward better initiatives on childcare as being important for women. Because of course that is. We know that women carry more burden in terms of family responsibilities. But that's not where a gender focus or a gender lens should limit. For example, we had a proposal on uh, a pipeline project uh, come before cabinet and the question came, okay, uh, was there a gender analysis done on it? And someone sort of shrugged and said, well, it's a pipeline construction. There's no gender analysis that needs to be done on that. And said, on the contrary, when you're building a remote energy project like a pipeline, you are having construction workers descend on remote or small communities. Those construction workers are predominantly male. They will be there for uh, a long period of time. They will have a definite impact on the community in which they are. And are we ensuring that there are supports for that community, that we have thought through the gender implications of this project that we're uh, looking at amongst so many others in Cabinet? So as we look at everything government does, we have to do a better job of looking at it with a lens that says what are the context and consequences of this uh, for women, but for various vulnerable groups. And in that, men have a really important role to play as well. Uh, I want to highlight that here we know uh, at um, at, at this Davos conference, uh, there's only it's 10 or 15 percent uh, women uh, actual attendees. Here in this room, uh, I guess it's about 60 or 70 percent women for this particular panel. So I would like to uh, pause and specifically thank all the men uh, who are here today uh, for being part of this. And could you tell your friends who didn't come to this one? Uh, that this is a really important topic that we all have to have a role in. I remember some of the first times I was on a panel on empowerment of women or, or a particular women's focus thing as the man on the panel. I was very, a little bit self-conscious and almost apologetic saying well, this is an important topic but you know, I'm glad to be here uh, to add my voice. I'm no longer apologetic about being, or self-conscious about being a man on uh, a uh, feminist panel or a feminist issues panel because men have an essential role to play as allies, as partners. If we live in a society, and we do unfortunately, where men have more power than women because of uh, the ways things are in the past, men have an essential role in using that power to change the reality that we are stuck with and never, never hesitate uh, to, uh, as a man, step up as an ally uh, and ask how we can do better at stepping up as allies uh, and as women involving men uh, in this essential fight because women's, women's rights are human's rights and we all have a role to play in making the change. Thank you. I should also tell all those men that were not here today that somewhere there are going to be a minority someplace and they should come and learn about how to uh, empower themselves to be part of whatever it is that's going on. Because um, I think that's true not just for women, frankly. It's true for anybody who feels uncomfortable to be part of any group. And what we're talking here is about inclusive education that empowers you to be there for part of what exists today and what the future may look like. Let me uh, switch a little bit and talk, uh, add one element to the mix. We've talked about education uh, institutions, we've talked about governments in different forms, we've talked about the role that a fund foundation like yours does. What about business? How, from your points of view, uh, other than myself, there's not a business point of view here, but I'd like to see how you see cooperation with business because clearly that's an important part not only of fixing the ills of today, but of building the right kind of tools for the future that we mentioned. Um, Malala, would you like to start? Uh, yes, I think it's a very important question, and I kept on mentioning businesses that they have a role to play in this. And um, I'm already seeing that there are a few top businesses and, and companies that have focused on women and, and girls' education, but I think that's not enough, and we need more businesses to follow uh, their examples and invest in women and girls' empowerment. Imagine, like, companies want talent. They want skills. 
And if you give quality education to girls, you empower women, you get more skills, you get more talent, and this is, in, in turn, this is, uh, this, is, this is a benefit, this is an advantage to the companies. Uh, so I think uh, investment in, in education for girls would give high returns to scale for these businesses, uh, and I think uh, this is something that I hope businesses follow and, and uh, yeah. Fabiola. Well, let me inject a little bit of um, a thought about one of the challenges that we have uh, today. We mentioned that um, equal access to education is one. The other one that I see is how to reconcile and, and find the right balance between a world which requires an education which is highly specialized, and we were say, what we were saying before, that, that society is evolving so fast that if you are too specialized, perhaps in 10 years from now, you will not find a job. Okay, so this is a big challenge. How to find really the balance between the short-term needs and the long-term needs. In, in a world where automation is becoming more and more important, machine learning, uh, artificial in intelligence, robotics, which, and many jobs that today are important, will disappear. So I think it requires a strong partnership between governments, between, between universities, edu um, high degrees education, and, uh, and also education in general, also high schools and uh, uh, vocational uh, path, and, uh, uh, and the private sector, the industry in preparing the workforce of tomorrow. It's a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, Minister, would you like to uh, add? Well, obviously, we need to ensure that, that companies do a better job of, of you know, looking for an equal number of male and female applicants for any given job. Uh, don't accept that, oh, there are just you know, not many women out there applying for the job. You have to do a little more proactive reaching out to try and uh, find women uh, and encourage them to uh, to apply for promotions, apply for, for good jobs, and that's part of the culture shift that we need. But one of the aspects of business, particularly in a place uh, like this where we talk about multinationals and big businesses, we, we tend to overlook and we really shouldn't, is small businesses. Uh, the number of women entrepreneurs out there is growing, the number of women who run and create uh, small businesses that have a extraordinary impact on the communities in terms of economic growth, in terms of hiring, uh, in terms of uh, uh, opportunities, but also significantly in terms of delivering goods and services that are better uh, suited to uh, half the population that might not be uh, well served or uh, that has a social consciousness or a, a community impact that is uh, more positive in many cases than businesses created or run by men. Making sure we're looking at the barriers to entry, whether it's access to capital, uh, access to mentorship, uh, access to uh, knowledge and understanding on how to, how to succeed, how to succeed in a globalized world. All the barriers that exist to women's success in, you know, in general uh, can be amplified uh, in uh, the business community or in the context of uh, trying to create a successful business, which is hard enough as it is. So making sure that we are deliberately thinking about as governments, as uh, community organizations, as institutions, as, as uh, a broad range of, of actors within society, how to ensure that women can be successful in business is uh, going to be uh, an element of the future that we cannot avoid. Thank you. So let me just add something to that from the point of view of business. It used to be that it was the right thing to do, whether it was women or any kind of diversity. And there are all kinds of programs that businesses uh, came up with. And they weren't that successful, where they, they sort of, there was this uh, shrinkage along the ways of uh, women from uh, important positions. And then the discussion moved to the battle uh, for talent. And it became more real. How can you ignore 50% of the population? Or how can you ignore X, Y, or Z? Or a creative part of the population of somebody from a different uh, ethnicity. But it was still war for talent. And without, so people put more diverse people together, but didn't really think much about how to commit to ensuring that it would work. And um, I think where we are now, which I think is an important next step when it comes to business, is that it's a competitive advantage. I know from our business, there was no question in my mind. It's not just women, it's diversity of all kinds. And by now we actually have science on our side. So it started by research. 
a lot of causality, I mean, a lot of um, correlations as opposed to causality, which even without a strong scientific background was hard for me to accept. But then some micro uh, research that actually show that even if you put um, black and white people together in a jury as opposed to a white or all black, the outcome is going to be that much better. And they've done it a lot with mock juries. And that is because in a jury, everybody has to talk. And every, then you have to have a consensus. So you can't just sit there and not say anything, which is what happens many times when you bring diverse people together and don't create the climate. And, uh, and then actually behavioral economics with Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize a long time ago, started to explain to us about some of the behavior that we exhibit in diverse groups. And today neuroscience actually can see what the brain does when you put people together from diverse groups and don't explain to them a little bit about the fact that they, they will have an unconscious bias. If you have a brain, you have an unconscious bias, can't change you, but I will make you aware of that. And actually there are some tests that I think it would be very interesting for people to, I have taken them out of curiosity for, for the sake of our business, not for anything else. Um, and, and, and then how to create actually sort of the psychological safety for people to be there. So you don't just put people in a room, to use an analogy, you put in a, people in a room with some guidelines about how to make it comfortable, inclusive, and safe for everybody, whether it's a woman, a young person with a different sexual orientation or a different ethnicity or whatever. The, 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 uh, it's a little less comfortable the first time around, but the product is so much better and the outcome is so much better that it really becomes a competitive advantage. You just need to have the same commitment to that in business as you have to any other business aspect. The same things, the same kind of uh, interesting things going into recruiting and promotion and role models and then goes from there. But I'll stop here because I just wanted to add to what you were saying. I think business does have an important role to play. And, and that's, by the way, it's a different education for people late in their life, but it's whenever it comes, it's very important. And once you're, you're comfortable in that in a diverse group, you stop thinking about it, you welcome it. Yeah, but, but I mean, that, that, that's a really essential point. It, it, there's a lot of effort being done in recruiting more women and recognizing that that's an important thing but we still are working on coming to grips with the way that will and the way that it must change the environment in which uh, we work, but also we live, we govern. As an organization in government, we, uh, as a party, we reached out uh, to get more women to run. Before we could say, oh, it's 2015, therefore we have a gender balanced cabinet, it had to be 20. 14, 2013, 2012, where we actually actively went out and recruited women and asked them time and time and time again to run for politics uh, when it's harder to get women to run for politics. And then once we did and we were successful, we're now realizing uh, that there's a lot of things about the way our organization, you know, the House of Commons in Canada is structured that is not conducive to uh, a positive environment for women, for people. I mean, we, for the very first time, our Minister of uh, International, uh, sorry, of uh, Democratic Institutions, uh, well, the first time any minister is going to have a baby while being minister. And this is something that uh, is a challenge. I mean, there have been many, many men ministers who've had uh, children while they were ministers, but it doesn't have the same kind of uh, impact uh, on their lives, obviously. So this is a new thing we have to figure out, what parental leave looks like for a minister uh, and how, uh, how to make that work. But these are essential conversations we have to have that will be replicated uh, throughout workforces across, across, uh, across the country around the world. Uh, and part of that is, of course, the Me Too movement, uh, recognizing that harassment and assault is unacceptable, and we need to be unequivocal about how we respond to it, step up to it, and take action on it. And we have to understand that as we've created uh, essential space for these conversations and we've empowered women to come forward and in most cases women come forward and feel listened to and validated and believed in what they say, we are going to see more and more examples of women who in previous times would have stayed silent saying, no, you know what? This is a problem and I am going to, I'm going to tell my story. And as organizations, and as a world, we're going to have to adjust and adapt and learn and change 
the way we look at power dynamics, the way we look at the hierarchies within our organizations, the way we look at the culture and atmosphere that is created in so many different organizations. And that level of mindfulness is something we have to do a much, much better job of. Avila, I see you nodding your head. Well, in, uh, as you said, uh, I think, I believe that the diversity in all its, uh, in all its forms, gender, um, ethnicity, culture, is perhaps the strongest asset of humanity. And it's clear that a diverse uh, workforce is much stronger than a, a, a unilateral workforce because it space benefits from the, from the views and the, and the, and the expertise of, uh, of, of, of different people. Um, as you said, uh, I think we will have reached inclusiveness and diversity the day where we will stop thinking about it because it, be it has become natural. My own experience in the environment I live at CERN with these people from more than 100 nationalities, for me, is absolutely natural to sit at a table with people uh, who have a different passport, passport from mine. And for me, it will, I mean, I couldn't imagine just work with Italians, not because I don't like Italy. I love Italy. It's my country. But because I'm used to share and to work with, with people from all over the world. So we really have to, to push for that. And, uh, and, and what you learn when working with people like that is, of course, uh, you, know, you learn lessons for life. Uh, you, you, you become more tolerant, more open, and, uh, and the value of diversity and of inclusiveness is really a very, very valuable one. Let me just add something to the diversity. When we talk about diversity, I think we're not just talking about natural backgrounds and ethnicity and gender, but just diversity of experience as well. I think Apple is famous for saying that they have those magical products because they bring engineers and software writers, but also musicians and artists to focus on making those products. And I think that's part of the theme that has sort of run here through. I, I happen to think that that's a very important part of the education of the way uh, the workforce is going to have to be. Um, any famous last words? I'll start with you, Fabiola. What, if, what would you like to leave the audience with on this topic? Perhaps I would like to, 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 to convey the message that we need also to break the, uh, the cultural silos. Uh, too often people um, put science and humanities or science and the arts in different compartments. They think they are mutually exclusive. They think uh, they, are, they are not much in common and they do have a lot in common. They are the highest expression of, of, uh, of the creativity, of the curiosity, of the imagination of humanity. So uh, we should really talk about culture in general, not be too much uh, you know, focused on one particular sector of the culture. And this is a very good message that we can give to the teachers and to the young people for a, for a better world and to be also to grow with yeah, more arm to, uh, to, to face the challenges of society. Thank you. Malala. Um, I would say that each and every action that we take, it matters. And when you talk about women's equality, women's empowerment, girls' education, it's not just one simple thing. We have to change the way we act. We have to change the way we speak. We have to change the way we address this issue. Um, if a company believes that they are work, they are feminist and they are investing in girls, like as you mentioned, like how many female staff they have, how many women they have allowed at senior roles, how many opportunities that they give to women. So I think change has to come the way we uh, approach this. And um, so I'll just give example of my, my father. Uh, he believed in women's rights and he was a feminist. Uh, but he did not just say it, he acted when um, our, my father's cousin, he brought the family tree and it was full of men's names. There was no woman's name mentioned on that, even though women were born in that family. Uh, and my father wrote down my name. The first girl name to be written on that family tree. My father allowed me to go to school. My father allowed me to speak. So these are the things that we need to remember that uh, each and every action that we take, whichever sector we belong to, whether it's business or government or NGOs or uh, schools or hospitals, wherever we are, uh, we have to remember that uh, we must ensure that we give equal opportunities to women, we focus on women empowerment, and we focus on girls' education. And there are so many resources that we have at government level, at business level, like look at the, the science, the tech, and, and the expertise that they have. Like, what, do we, what should we do with that? 
what should we do with all that resource that we have got? And I think the simple answer is invest them, invest them in women, invest them in girls, and, and, and then the benefits are countless, and I'm just, when I just think for a second that half of the population of women, when they're le lagging behind, imagine when they are empowered, how much change are we going to see in the world from economic growth to improvement in the living standards to improvement in, in achieving equality. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm excited and I think it, all it needs is, is just doing something. And, and we need to do that and, and start soon. Thank you, Malala. Thank you. Prime Minister. I can't say it better than that. So all I'll say is that men have to have the courage to be feminists and the integrity to be allies. That was quite a statement. I would take that and enlarge it to every minority in the world or everybody who is disadvantaged, and I thank you for being so um, focused on it. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for really talking about a topic that started with education and empowerment, but really sort of has broadened, because it does, to everything, to diversity of different kinds, not just gender, although we talked a lot about gender, to early education, to late education, to empowerment early on, because that's important, to continuous empowerment uh, through life, to learning through life, the role of, of business, which is, it is to their advantage at this point, it's not just something that they should do, uh, whether you look at institutions, education institutions, at governments, at business, at society in general. We've had uh, an important announcement here today. We had another announcement from CERN. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for the men and the women and the educators and those who would like to continue the education. And thank you all very much. Thank you so much.